Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Looks like everybody has a seat today. See, I, I told you that would happen. That's good. I, I don't feel bad anymore, people sitting in the aisle. Today we're going to talk about genomes and genetics. We're going to talk about the different kinds of viral genomes that exist, that is, the genetic information of the viruses. We're going to talk a little bit about how they work. Uh, we're going to get more into that in detail in, in other lectures. Uh, we'll talk about how they're expressed. And then we will talk about genetics, which is how we manipulate the viral genome these days to make variation uh, in the virus and study the virus. And then at the end, a little bit of gene therapy. <coughs> if you notice, on every slide, I have a little quote, right? And this one is from Erwin Shargaff. Anybody know who uh, Erwin Shargaff was? No? They didn't teach you that in biology? Yes. So this is a guy, he used to be a professor up at the medical school, Columbia Medical School. He's a guy who figured out that A equals T and C equals G, the equivalence of those bases, which led the way to Watson and Crick. And he was a very, very bitter man because he never got credit for this. He never got the Nobel Prize. And uh, he died not too long ago, actually. And his obituary said he died a bitter man, which is really sad. <laughs> it's too bad. So moral is be happy in your life no matter what you do. Anyway, this is a really cool saying, everywhere an interplay between nucleic acids and proteins, a spinning wheel in which the thread makes the spindle and the spindle the thread. It doesn't sound like a bitter man, does it? It's pretty good. All right. Now, in the 1950s, the breakthrough in, in virology was the demonstration that the nucleic acid of the virus is the genetic code. And even though this sounds obvious today, it wasn't back then. People thought that the proteins, in fact, uh, might be the important parts because they were so much more complicated. Nucleic acids were simple. They only had four different chemicals in them. And this <coughs> conclusion came from initially uh, two kinds of studies. First, uh, the Hershey Chase experiment, a very famous experiment, which I'm sure you were taught uh, in biology with bacteriophage T4, shown here in, in an electron micrograph. Uh, and then the work of Frankel Conrad, uh, with tobacco mosaic virus. And I'm not sure we're going to talk about this today, but what they did here was simply to take the virus and break it into RNA and protein components and showed that the RNA had the infectivity of the virus. Hershey Chase will talk about right here. So here is uh, Al Hershey and Martha Chase. Uh, they worked at Cold Spring Harbor for many years out on Long Island. And they did this very famous experiment using a food blender common kitchen blender. And what they did, they wanted to know if you take a bacteriophage, wh which is the genetic information? Which specifies the production of more viruses? Is it the protein shell or is it the nucleic acid? So they would grow phages with radioactive precursors to protein or radioactive precursors to the DNA. And when they labeled the DNA and then they, they would infect E. coli very briefly and then use the, a blender to shear off the infecting phage. That was what the blender was for. So they only let the phage attach very briefly enough to put the, the genetic information in the cell. And when they did this, uh, the radioactivity was predominantly found in the cell after a brief infection when you labeled the DNA. Uh, and then the DNA was detected in the next generation of phage. And it, when you labeled the protein, the, the coat of the virus, uh, that did not remain cell associated and it was never passed on to the next generation. So this is called the Hershey Chase experiment. If you ever go out to Cold Spring Harbor for a meeting, there's a library out there. I think it's called the Carnegie Library. And they have one of uh, Hershey's blenders in a, in a glass case there uh, for you to look at. It's pretty neat. It was out there this summer. So this was very important because it showed that the nucleic acid was the genetic information of the virus. Now, even the bigger surprise, perhaps above that the nucleic acid is, is the genetic information, because in fact for cells we already knew that. We knew that the DNA of cells was the genetic information. So this was a good move forward, but not a big surprise. But what really uh, is surprising, you know, I've told you a lot about all the viruses that are out there, billions and billions, and um, all different kinds, shapes, forms, yet in the end you can make them all fall into very nice categories because they only have a finite number of nucleic acid genomes and that is number seven and that's a number you should remember 
because it's easy, right? It's a subway number. But uh, it's going to help you remember all the different viral genomes because when you count up to seven, uh, you'll be done. All right, seven different kinds of genome. And that will really help us organize all these viruses in terms of how they work. It will really help you. So <clears throat> the key fact that will really, in addition to the number seven, to help organize all of this is that every viral genome has to make mRNA that the host can translate. Because remember, no uh, virus encodes a complete translation apparatus. Viruses are parasites of the host translation system. So every virus follows this rule. And I would guess that if we ever found a virus that didn't, it probably wouldn't be a virus. It would be a cell of some kind, a very small cell. So all viruses have to make mRNA that can be read. So if you think of that, then every virus replication cycle is simple in the sense that it all has to lead to mRNA that can be pr translated by the host cell. And that's a ribosome. It's not a turkey. This is, <laughs> this is a ribosome. <clears throat> all right, now, David Baltimore who uh, was a Nobel laureate for discovering an enzyme that we'll talk about later on, another lecture. He used this insight, the idea that every virus has to make mRNA to organize all the known viral genomes into this scheme, which is uh, nicely called the Baltimore scheme. Um, and he put mRNA in the middle. He said every genome has to lead to this. And then he arrayed around it all the known genomes. This was in the 70s that he did that. He put single-stranded DNA plus sense RNA that goes through a DNA intermediate, other plus stranded RNA viruses, uh, negative stranded RNA viruses, double stranded RNA viruses. We're, we're going to talk about each of these in detail. He missed one. I, I didn't tell you double stranded DNA, of course. He got that as well. All the ones that are numbered, he got. But at the time when he made this scheme, the hepatitis B virus had not yet uh, been discovered. Its genome wasn't known. And so that was added later, this funny double-stranded DNA with gaps. So he said all of these have to go to mRNA, so we arrange them in this very nice rubric, which if you learn, it will help you enormously because given a viral genome, you'll be able to figure out how it's expressed. And we'll go through that today. David Baltimore, of, uh, of course, likes to fish. That's him up there. Uh, so before we go on with the Baltimore scheme, let's do some definitions. So we are all talking the same language, and these have to do with polarity. As you know, probably mRNA is, by convention, the plus strand. Someone asked me last year, does it have to do with charge or something, electricity? No, it has nothing to do with any of that. It's just convention that what is translated mRNA is called the plus strand. So a DNA strand that is the equivalent polarity as mRNA is the plus strand. And of course, the complements of plus strands are negative strands or minus strands. So we, we use the word interchangeably, plus positive, minus negative. And it's just a way to identify what strand we're talking about. And of course, mRNA, the plus strand is ribosome ready. It can be translated into protein. That's the definition of mRNA. But one thing I want to tell you is that not all plus RNA, especially in the virus world, is mRNA. There are some viruses that have plus stranded RNA genomes but it's not mRNA, it's not translated. So just being plus stranded is not enough to get you translated. There are other requirements as well. All right, so then when we look at the Baltimore scheme, these pluses and minus, that's what they refer to, the polarity of the nucleic acid uh, with respect to mRNA. So for example, the single stranded plus strand DNA viruses, they have a single strand of DNA, it's plus polarity. That is the same polarity as mRNA. But of course, DNA cannot be translated. And that's one of the things you, you realize already by looking at the kind of nucleic acids that's present. You can already deduce uh, what viruses have to do to get to mRNA. <clears throat> so this is really an elegant system. All you have to know is what kind of genome is in the virus. And then you can tell me all of the steps that have to be taken to get mRNA. Okay. Because in fact, when a virus brings a genome into the cell, that's, that's what it has to do. It has to make mRNA to initiate the infectious cycle. So if you can remember this scheme, you'll be able to trace it. And that's really uh, a lot of what we want you to know in this course. So you don't have to memorize that there are billions and billions of viruses, but just that there are seven different genome types in the way that they get to uh, mRNA. So here are the seven classes of genome. 
we have double-stranded DNA. So there's a bunch of viruses with DNA genomes. They can be double-stranded or single-stranded, and they can be gapped. So that really covers everything. I, I can't think of anything else. Single, double strand, and a gap. A gap was thrown in later, but makes sense. And then we have RNA, viruses with RNA genomes. And this is, of course, what is in the particle itself. The, the virus particle, it, that's what I mean by the genome, uh, shown up here on this slide. So we have double stranded RNA genomes, and then we have single stranded RNA genomes. But we have uh, single stranded RNA genomes of three types. We have plus stranded, uh, we have minus stranded, and then we have a plus stranded genome which goes through a DNA intermediate. These are very special viruses that we'll deal with separately. All right, so those are the seven classes. Now you may ask why aren't there plus single stranded DNA viruses and minus single strand DNA viruses? I don't know. You know, you know the idea of ignorance. You t some of you are taking Feierstein's course, right? We have a lot of ignorance in virology, I'm happy to say, and I, and I told Stuart that myself a while ago, <laughs> so I'm going to tell you often what we don't know. I don't know why there aren't any plus and minus DNA. There are some uh, of these single-stranded DNA minuses that package either a plus or a minus strand, but we don't know any that is exclusively either plus or minus like these RNA viruses. All right? You just have to accept that they exist and we don't know why. Now in addition to these seven genome types. That's really the main thing you need to know. But I, I just want to show you the different kinds of structures that these seven types occur in. So they can be linear, they can be circular, they can occur in segments. So some viral genomes are in one molecule, unimolecular if you will, and some are segmented. They come in pieces. Or you could say that our genome is segmented, right? It's in chromosomes. It's in pieces. And some viruses are, are segmented. They're not really chromosomes because they don't have the same structure, but they're segmented. Gapped, as we said already, with the hepatitis B. Uh, single strands of plus and minus po polarity. There's also a single-stranded genome that's ambisense. It's got components of both plus and minus strands in it. Pretty unusual. We have double-stranded, of course. And then some genomes have proteins covalently attached to them. Some have the ends cross-linked. So you have a double-stranded DNA, and where you would normally have five and three prime ends, they're just cross-linked, so you have a little circle at the end. So if you denatured it, it would become a single-stranded circle. And some have DNA with covalently attached RNA. So all kinds of things happen. Now, this is less important. These are the details, which we'll explain to you, but the seven is really the important part, the seven uh, different genome types. Now, you may be wondering, what is the purpose of all of this? Does having seven different genome types and all these weird configurations make a difference? Does it have to do with the biology of the virus? Does it have to do with evolution? Um, is it advantageous? And maybe most of all, you want to know if you have to memorize it. So let me try and answer. There's a lot of ignorance here, unfortunately. I can't answer most of these questions, but I, I, I sense that people Think of this right away. Humans have DNA genomes. All humans. All mammals do. So why do viruses have to have all these configurations? Well, we don't know the answer. All we can do is guess, and we get better at guessing, but in the end it's still a guess. <coughs> so for example, um, the structure and composition of the genome, whether it's DNA, RNA, single or double-stranded, is a reflection of how it replicates, but that's really because the replication has to accommodate the the strandedness and the polarity and the composition of the genome. So it doesn't really tell us anything. There are viruses with all of these seven types of genomes out there, and I don't know if any one has a selective advantage over another. For example, I would say, so if I'm looking at viruses from a human point of view, which is wrong, right, so you shouldn't do this, as I told you before, I would say the plus-stranded, single-stranded RNA viruses would be the most advantageous because it's a plus strand, it's an mRNA, as soon as it gets in the cell, boom, it can be translated. I would say that this would be the fastest and the most advantageous. Now, there are a lot of plus strand viruses on the globe, but they're not the only ones. <clears throat> there are lots of other. They're negative strand viruses. Why would you do that? As you'll see, with a negative strand, you have to carry an enzyme in the particle in order to, to initiate infection. So, you see, none of this makes sense when you look at it from our point of view. But from an evolutionary point of view, at some time, 
a plus strand, a minus strand, a gapped genome. It worked. It survives. And that's all we can say at this point. Not a great answer, but that's what we're stuck with. Now, another interesting question is why do we have both DNA and RNA genomes in viruses? And that, I think, we can address a little better, although it's still speculative. I think you know that many people believe that the first world of life was an RNA world where all the organisms had RNA genomes. There's some evidence, some pretty good evidence for this from a, a variety of areas. So we think that these RNA viruses evolved during the RNA world. So there are RNA cells first and then RNA viruses evolved probably from those cells, but we don't know, to infect them. Uh, and uh, those RNA viruses that existed then are probably the ancestors of all the RNA viruses that we have today. So maybe our RNA viruses are relics from that RNA world. Now at some point, the idea goes that there's a switch from RNA to DNA-based organisms. Or maybe not a switch, but DNA-based organisms evolved. And the whole idea behind this is very interesting. Um, but there was a, a, another kind of organism that had DNA. And these RNA-based organisms slowly were competed out, but the RNA viruses lived. Why, why would there be a switch? We have no idea. We don't know what the selection would be for that. It could be that a DNA-based organism arose, so enzymes arose that could change RNA chemically into DNA, and they survived, and they had some kind of advantage. That's really all we can say. So the way I look at it is RNA viruses are pretty old. They've been very successful, and the DNA, <laughs> the DNA viruses are the uh, newcomers on the block. Now, in terms of memorization, this is the one thing I think you should memorize. The number seven which is easy. You know, you have lots of number seven references here in New York City. Um, and this scheme, which is very easy to do, you put mRNA in the middle and then draw the seven different kinds of viral genome around it. I don't care if you know the numbers here. That doesn't mean anything. All you need to do is draw all these viral genome types and then be able to draw the pathway to mRNA. Because just knowing that, you're going you're gonna to conquer the first half of this course because you're going to understand what we're talking about when we talk about RNA and DNA synthesis and so forth, okay? Now, as we illustrate these processes, we'll use specific viruses as examples. And you see I've put a few of them here so you know what virus has a single-stranded negative-strand genome. Otherwise, it would be really not interesting to you at all. So negative-strand RNA viruses include influenza and Ebola. Uh, polio, the plus strand. Retroviruses are the ones that go from a plus strand to a DNA intermediate. Parvoviruses, <coughs> hepatitis B, adenovirus, herpes, rio, and rotavirus. So these are just a, a few of all the viruses that exist, but we're going to come back to these over and over and use them as examples. So you should know that real virus has a double-stranded RNA genome, because if we say on a test, uh, real viruses do what when the genome enters the cell? You're going to have to know that it's double-stranded RNA. So this, this one slide is very important, but this is very easy to do. Okay, so memorize these seven genome types. You should start doing it. Maybe you could wait until the first exam if you're good at that sort of thing. And, I, and this is what I want you to know. If you know the genome structure, how mRNA is made and how the genome is copied. All right. Eventually, we're going to learn about how the genomes are copied in a, in a more detailed way than today. But from today's perspective, given any virus genome class, a single-stranded plus sense, for example, you're going to tell me how mRNA is made and how the genome is copied. Now, you don't know yet how to do this. I'm going to tell you today. And it's pretty straightforward, so this is not a big deal. All right, before we talk about the genomes individually, I want to tell you what is and what is not encoded in a virus genome because they're very different from, from ours, of course. They're much smaller, and so they don't have the luxuries of, of encoding all the proteins that we do. These kinds of things are encoded. Uh, proteins that you need to replicate the genome, of course, to assemble a particle, to package the genome in the particle, to time the replication cycle. You know, we make proteins that regulate transcription. Viruses do the same thing. Modulation of host defenses. This is a pretty recent discovery in virology. Viruses make proteins that overcome host defenses. If they didn't do this, they wouldn't exist. Every virus that we know of encodes at least prote one protein that antagonizes immune responses. It have to because immune responses are so good. And finally, they encode proteins that allow the viruses to spread uh, to, to other cells or 
spread through the air, through an aerosol, for example. <coughs> okay, what's not encoded in a genome? Lots of things are not encoded. Uh, no genes encoding the complete protein synthesis machinery. When I started teaching this course, I said four years ago, that used to say, no part of the protein synthesis machinery. And then we discovered Mimi viruses, which encode uh, amino acyl tRNA synthetases and other initiation proteins. So now the Mimis don't have the whole thing. They don't have ribosomes and tRNAs and all the proteins you need, but they have a, a part of it. No virus can do the whole thing. That's, where, that's why they're translational parasites. They can't make energy on their own. They can't respire. They can't do respiration. They can't make membranes. They have to get all of that from the cell. They don't have telomeres or centromeres either. They have some things that look like them, but uh, not really what, what is in our cells. Now, you could argue that we just haven't discovered them yet in viruses, and that's fair because most of the viruses out there we don't know of. They remain to be really studied. But I would argue that once, as I said before, once you find a complete protein synthesis machinery encoded in a virus genome, it's getting pretty close to a cell, although maybe it still can't make energy and, and make membranes. But it would be really interesting to find those because, you know, one of the ideas for the evolution of viruses is that they came from cells. They left cells with a package of genes. So the question is, what genes did they initially have? And maybe there are some old viruses around that still have the original sets of genes that could inform us. And then they decided they didn't need to carry a protein synthesis machinery, for example. All right, so let's first talk about our uh, DNA genomes. So we have DNA, viruses replicate in us. And so for the most part, the way viral DNA replication happens for these DNA viruses, it emulates the host. Um, but most DNA genomes are not like cell chromosomes, as I've just told you. They are not chromosomes. Uh, there are some people who want to call them chromosomes, but they're not. They don't have the histones associated with them. They're not all coiled up in that way. Although some of them look a bit like uh, the coiled <coughs> status of, of, of our DNA, but they're not the same. They don't have telomeres and so on. But these viral DNA genomes are different because they've evolved ways to do things, to replicate their genomes and segregate them and so forth that, that differ from ours. And that's to be expected once you separate them uh, from the host cell. So here are the viruses with double-stranded uh, DNA genomes that we'll mainly talk about in this course. Uh, and you know, as we go through the stages of replication, we'll make reference to these. As we talk about disease, we will also make reference to these as well. So these are all viruses that infect mammals. Lots of other viruses with these genomes that infect, that infect plants and bacteria and all, all sorts of other forms of life, but uh, we're not going to be talking about them because they're not studied very much, so we don't know a lot about them. Adenoviruses, this you'll recognize, it looks like a satellite. It has a very interesting virion with these projections. We'll talk about that. Hepatitis B virus. Now, these are all family names here. Remember, adenoviridae means it's a family, so it's always capitalized and italicized. And one member of adenoviridae is adenovirus. Hepatitis B virus, uh, that might be hard for you to pick up from a diagram. Herpes viruses, these big guys, really quite large viruses with a lot of seemingly junk between the membrane and the capsid. We'll talk a lot about those. And then two rather small viruses, papillomaviruses, these are the viruses that cause warts, and polyomaviruses, which can infect many different animals, including us, and most of the ones that infect us don't seem to cause anything, although there are some exceptions. They're rather small with no membranes, as you'll see. And finally, the pox viruses, which are quite large and complicated. And um, there are bigger viruses than this. As we said, the Mimi viruses are bigger, but we're not going to talk much about them because we don't know much about them. Now, uh, the genomes of these viruses have different configurations, and they come in different sizes, and that has implications. So let's first look at the information flow. So a virus with a double-stranded DNA genome. Remember, if you do the Baltimore scheme approach, you put mRNA here, and then you ask, how do we get to mRNA? Well, if you're double-stranded DNA, it's easy, because DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, Paul 2 say, in your cell, can copy a double-stranded DNA template and make RNA. That's what it does for a living. So you can go right to mRNA from double-stranded DNA. That is, that is very easy. 
So in these viruses, when they get into the cell, they make mRNA. So to do that, they have to go into the nucleus for the most part. There's one exception, which I'll tell you. Go in the nucleus, make mRNA. That has to go back out in the cytoplasm. This is normal cell biology to make proteins. The genome has to replicate. So it goes from double-stranded to double-stranded DNA. We will talk about the mechanisms involved with that. And then eventually the DNA, the newly made DNA and the proteins make new particles. All right. So the, the couple of key things here, knowing that you can make mRNA right from a double-stranded DNA genome and where this has to happen. So in the cell, our mRNAs are made in the nucleus by Paul II. And most viruses will use that if they don't encode a Paul II. So most viruses will have to go into the nucleus. Now, on the left are two of the smaller uh, DNA virus genomes, viruses with double-stranded DNAs again. These are the polyomaviruses and the papillomas, five kilobases and eight kilobases, 5,000 and 8,000 bases long. And these happen to be double-stranded circles of DNA, right? So they're covalently closed, they're twisted, they're supercoiled, and all of that. They're rather small. They don't encode a lot of proteins. And these are typically copied by host DNA polymerase because they don't have enough room to encode DNA polymerase and all the proteins that you need. So they use host enzymes. They do encode at least one protein that modifies the DNA machinery in some way. That will be a theme. But these smaller viruses use the host DNA replication machinery. They also use the host transcriptional machinery. They use PAL2 to make mRNA. So these genomes have to go in the nucleus to make RNA and to replicate. On the right are genomes that are bigger, and these genomes, therefore, can encode their own DNA polymerase. The adenovirus genome, for example, uh, between 36 and 48,000 bases long. It's a single strand of double-stranded DNA. Um, it is unusual because it has a protein linked to the five prime ends, so that's one of these funny modifications that I talked about, and we'll, we'll talk later about what that's for. Herpes viruses genomes are bigger. They range between 120,000 and 220,000 base pairs. Now, I don't want you to know how big these genomes are. I just want you to know that big genomes encode DNA polymerase and small ones do not. That's the concept that is important. And finally, the pox virus genomes between 130 and 375 kilobase pairs. Now, the, the herpes genomes are, are simply double-stranded linear molecules, nothing unusual there. They have some interesting repeated sequences that we'll talk about later. The pox virus genome is also double-stranded linear, but the ends are covalently linked. I mentioned this earlier. Okay, so both ends, the five and three prime ends at each end are covalently joined. So if you denatured this molecule, it would just make a single-strand circle. Now, these viruses can encode <coughs> their own DNA polymerases. They also encode a lot of other enzymes as well. The one virus in this group that, that doesn't need to get into the nucleus to replicate is the pox virus. It's the biggest. And the Mimi viruses also turn out not to need to get into the nucleus. So they have the biggest genomes. They encode all the DNA replication machinery. They encode an RNA polymerase and all the factors you need for that. And they set up their, their replication sites in the cytoplasm. They don't care about the nucleus whatsoever. So that's the advantage of having a big genome. So these may be very old viruses, the earliest descendants from cells where they still had a lot of uh, genes derived from the host cell. All right, let's turn to the gapped double-stranded DNA genomes. These are the, the hepatitis B viruses. When these were discovered, they were just thought to be completely weird because look at this configuration. You have a double-stranded circular uh, DNA molecule. There's a gap, so it's not completely double-stranded, so you can see the gap here. And there's a little piece of RNA attached to one of the strands. That's the green bit here. And then there's also a protein. So this has lots of weird modifications. All of these make sense in terms of the way the virus genome replicates. So we will talk about that later. So you, you'll understand completely why there's a protein on here, why it's gapped, why there's a piece of RNA. By the way, most of these figures I'm showing you have a color convention. So mRNA plus stranded RNA is this... Uh, uh, Kelly green, light green, if you will. Uh, DNA, the, the plus strand is this uh, darker blue, and the minus strand is the light blue. So you can see here, this is the negative strand of DNA, the light blue color. This is the plus strand of DNA in the hep B genome. And this is a piece of, uh, of plus strand RNA, because it's the right color green. All right, so this genome, when it gets into the cell, 
can't be copied to make RNA. No Paul II in a cell can copy this because it has a gap and it has a protein and it has RNA. There's just no way that Paul II can do anything to it. And I mean, one way of looking at this is that in terms of mRNA synthesis, the only substrate is really a double-stranded DNA. So any kind of genome you see, if it's not double-stranded DNA, the first thing that has to be done when it gets into the cell is it has to be made into a double-stranded DNA molecule. So these weird hep B genomes get repaired, they become completely double-stranded, the RNA is taken off, protein is taken off, and then they can make mRNA. Now this uh, virus is unusual because it also <laughs> it does this strange business of making uh, another RNA from the double-stranded DNA. It's actually the same enzyme that makes both RNAs, but this pool of mRNAs, it converts to DNA first single and then double-stranded, and that's what it packages in the genome. So the genome has DNA in it, and it gets that not by replicating the DNA, but by making an RNA and then making a DNA copy of it. I can't tell you why it does this. We have no idea. It just worked at some time, and it still works. All right, so that's the information flow uh, for hepatitis B virus. Single-stranded DNA genomes. Single strands can't be copied into mRNA. Remember that. Only double-stranded DNA among the DNAs can be copied into mRNA. So a virus with a single-stranded DNA genome, whether it's packaging either the plus or the minus strand, has to be converted to double-stranded DNA, which is then transcribed by the host uh, RNA polymerase. And then you make proteins. This genome replicates, and it makes single strands as it replicates. And as I said earlier, uh, these viruses tend to package one or the other. A mixture of both. We don't know why. It's not exclusively plus or minus. It's a mixture. Uh, there are <clears throat> two different genome configurations uh, for these viruses. Um, Single-stranded DNA genomes. Circoviruses. 1.7 to 2.2 kb. Very small genomes, only encoding a few proteins. One or two proteins, really. Amazing that these viruses can uh, replicate. Single-stranded circular DNA genome. An example of a circovirus is TT virus. And this is a virus that has infected 90% of you. If I took your blood, 90% of you would have antibodies to this virus. You have no idea what it does. If anything, probably doesn't cause any disease. Maybe it helps us. <clears throat> we don't know. It, there are many related forms that infect other animals as well. And there's some pathogenic. There's some serious diseases of chickens that are caused by circoviruses. Uh, the other genome configuration is shown by the parvoviridae. These have linear DNA, single-stranded linear DNA genomes. The ends are base paired to form these uh, panhandle structures, and these have a role in genome replication, as you'll see. An example of a parvovirus is B19 parvo. It causes fifth disease, is a childhood rash disease, after measles and mumps and rubella and chickenpox, mumps, rubella, four, and that's the fifth disease that you get as a child if you have a a dog, you have to immunize them against canine parvoviruses, otherwise you, you could lose them. All right, so those are the DNA viruses. Um, there are a lot of them, but these, these viral genomes predominate on the planet. Yes? Could you just explain why the single-stranded DNA can't be encoded into RNA if RNA is liberated for someone stranded at a time? The substrate for RNA, uh, the, so the question is, why can't single-stranded DNAs be substrates for RNA polymerase? Because when RNA polymerase is copying a duplex, it's just copying one strand. Well, apparently, it needs to recognize a duplex initially, <coughs> and it can't recognize. It must not fold in the proper way for, for RNA polymerase to, to be able to recognize it. Yes? Uh, does the virus uh, utilize the cytoskeleton in order to travel to the nucleus? Absolutely. And we're going to talk about that. We didn't used to know that. But yes, viruses don't just diffuse around the cell. They attach to microtubules and move to the nucleus, if they have to get to the nucleus. But even if viruses don't need to go all the way to the nucleus, they still use the, the motors in the cell to move, yeah. Does it use the intermediate filament at all? Because that's the only one that travels through the nucleus. Yeah. yeah. So the question was, do viruses travel on, uh, on the cytoskeleton of the cell? And, and the answer is yes, and we will be talking about that. Was there another question? Yes. Right. found that the uh, DNA and the, the virions that have replicated contain radioactivity. How is that, like, how is that radioactivity transferred if the DNA has replicated using new phosphorus? Yeah, so uh, you can imagine as the DNA replicates, it's going to be diluted, right? 
because what you put in is only a certain amount of radioactive phosphorus. So there's not a lot of label transferred to the progeny. But it's enough to detect by you know, techniques, scintillation counting. I think the real key to that experiment, though, is that the radioactivity is inside the cell right after the phage attaches and, and injects its genome. Whereas if you label the protein, it never gets inside the cell. So for that to happen, though, would you have to have an SSDNA genome in the, in the infecting virus? <laughs> no, it could be double-stranded. In fact, those phages used in that experiment had double-stranded DNA genomes. <clears throat> now, this is serendipity because now we know that there are phages where the whole particle gets in the bacteria. So if Hershey had done his experiment with that, he would, have, he would have not gotten the same answer. So it's always the way it is in science. Someone would have figured it out eventually, but it would have been confusing. Okay. All right, RNA genomes. These are interesting because the cell can't copy them. The cell doesn't have uh, RNA enzymes that can replicate RNA genomes. Um, can make small RNAs, as you know, like interfering RNAs, but it cannot copy long DNA genomes. So all virus genomes encode their own RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. That's how we abbreviate these enzymes, RDRP. And these enzymes make new genomes from RNA viruses, genomes, and they also make mRNAs. And this can be a little confusing, the difference between a genome and the mRNA, especially if we're talking about a, a plus strand virus, but we'll try and sort it out. And of course, the mRNA, again, made by these viruses is ribosome readable. Here's one class of uh, genome, the double-stranded RNA viruses. They have double-stranded RNA genome, just like, um, well, just like double-stranded DNA or single-stranded DNA. Double-stranded RNA cannot be translated. So you'd think, well, there's a plus strand in there, right? Why can't the ribosome read it? It can't access it. So in order for double-stranded RNA viruses to be translated, you have to make m mRNA, and that's done by copying the negative strand to make a plus strand. So that's just something you're going to have to remember that, again, the only, well, not again, but the only RNA that can be translated is a single-stranded mRNA. They make proteins and they make new genomes from this single strands by copying them and they encapsidate them. There are quite a few uh, interesting viruses in this category. There are a number of human viruses that cause gastroenteritis. So when you, in the winter time, when you get sick, you're vomiting and you have diarrhea, some of these viruses can be the cause of that. And the real viruses, not only do they have double-stranded RNA genomes, but it's broken up into segments. So each particle can have uh, 10 or 11 double-stranded RNA segments. The single-stranded RNA viruses now, let's look at those with a plus-stranded genome. And that means that the genome, of course, is mRNA. A lot of viruses here, these are eight different families of uh, viruses that infect mammals. Some of them you may recognize, poliovirus and rhinoviruses, uh, members of the picornavirus family, uh, caliciviruses and astroviruses both cause gastroenteritis. There are a lot of viruses that can make you uh, rather uncomfortable uh, in this sense. So the double-stranded RNA viruses, these and there are others as well. Uh, SARS coronavirus, rather large virus. Um, the, the artery viruses, um, we won't really talk, these are mainly animal pathogens. Flaviviruses, yellow fever virus, West Nile, hepatitis C virus. Retroviruses like HIV, HTLV, uh, 1 and 2. And togaviruses, rubella virus, and viruses that cause encephalitis. So let's talk about uh, these genomes a bit. They're all single strands of RNA, they're plus polarity, so they can be translated. And they vary in length, depending on the virus. The longest uh, RNA genomes, 28 to 33 kilobases. So you notice that this is not as long as the longest DNA virus. These are rather shorter. We think RNA is, is more fragile. It's more subject to mutation than DNA. So there's probably a, an upper limit on the size of an RNA genome. And that may be it, although maybe we just haven't found the biggest one yet. And you can see the other viruses have different sized genomes. Um, these viruses typically have open reading frames. That's the green part of the RNA. It's, a, it's an mRNA that can be translated into protein. They have five prime untranslated regions. That's UTR. This is not translated into protein. They have three prime untranslated regions. Some of them have a poly A tail, and uh, some of them are capped at the five prime end. You probably know that for a messenger RNA to be efficiently translated, it needs a five prime cap and it needs a three prime 
poly A tail. But not every virus follows these rules. The flaviviruses aren't polyadenylated. And the picornas don't have a cap. They have a protein at the 5 prime end. And we'll talk about how they get around those requirements with those unusual structures. So what's the strategy? Well, you know that plus sense can be mRNA. All right? And so for these viruses, in fact, the genome is translated as soon as it gets into the cell. So this is the kind of virus that I think should, should win, but it doesn't because it's so efficient. The genome gets made into protein as soon as it gets into the cell. The genome then has to be replicated. Nothing fancy here. It goes from a plus to a minus stand, strand copy, and then the minus strand is copied back into a plus. And all this minus strand serves is a template to make more plus strands. That's all it is. All right, so that's our, our plus sense viruses. Now, there is a class of viruses that have plus stranded RNA genomes, but they go through a DNA intermediate, and those are the retroviruses. This one viral family, retroviridae. Uh, there are two human pathogens here, human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, and human T lymphotropic virus, HTLV, and they're HTLV1 and 2. Now, this is unusual in a number of ways. First of all, the RNA in the virion is copied to first a negative strand DNA, then that's made double-stranded. Uh, this is done by a viral enzyme, reverse transcriptase, and that is, in fact, the enzyme that David Baltimore, along with Howard Temin, discovered a number of years ago. Uh, and this DNA integrates into the chromosome of the host. So these are unusual in that they become a permanent part of the host cell DNA. Uh, and it's from the host genome that they're transcribed to make mRNA. So uh, you couldn't make stuff like this up if you wanted to design a, a replication cycle. So this virus, these viruses actually don't replicate and they don't make mRNA themselves. The cell does it. Because the genome is replicating with your chromosomal DNA always. The virus doesn't have any DNA polymerase that it needs to use. And the RNA is made by the host cell enzyme as well. Okay, so that's an interesting strategy. So within the genome, you make mRNA and then protein. Uh, eventually, you take some of those R mRNAs and you package them into virions and you get new particles. So this is unusual that you make a DNA intermediate, but it allows the virus to become a permanent part of the host cell. So that has some advantages, as you will see. The other weird thing here is that so plus RNA is, is messenger RNA, right? So this should be translated, but it isn't. <clears throat> so this is one virus family where you'll have to remember that this RNA that comes in the cell, first thing that happens is not translation. It is copying to a DNA intermediate. So that's retroviruses. And that brings us to negative strands, single-stranded RNA viruses. Lots of uh, pretty nasty pathogens here. We have um, measles and mumps virus. Those are paramyxoviruses here. Rabies virus, which is the bullet-shaped virus. The filoviruses, Ebola and Marburg viruses, filamentous uh, viruses. Influenza virus, the family is orthomyxoviridae. And arenaviridae, famous virus, Lassa virus. Uh, Lassa was the topic of this book called Fever. This was written in, in the 1960s, and when I read this book, it made me want to be a virologist. So this is, this is why I'm doing this today, because of this book. I, I had graduated from college, and I didn't know what to do, and I was reading, and I read this, and I said, I have to do virology, and that's it, and that's, that's what happened. So this is a really cool book, which takes place in part up at Columbia. Uh, a lot of the victims, the people were dying in Africa, they didn't know why, and, and they were shipping them back to Columbia on commercial airliners. And it turns out that this is an incredibly deadly virus. If you want to work with it today, you need to work in a highly contained facility, a BSL-4 facility. Anyway, that's an arena virus. So these have negative stranded RNA. So you can predict the first thing that has to happen when this RNA gets into the cell. It's not going to be translated, right? Because it's not plus mRNA. So it has to be copied to a mRNA. Cells can't do this, right? Cells don't have the machinery to copy it. So the virus has to bring in with it in the particle an enzyme that can copy the negative strand into an mRNA. So that's really easy to remember. That's why I say all of this makes perfect sense with a few facts put in your head 
you can then trace the lifestyle of all these viruses. So these viruses carry an RNA polymerase in the particle. All the negative strand RNA viruses do that. Um, they make mRNA, which is translated into protein. And then to make more genomes, they go through a plus RNA intermediate uh, to make more RNAs, and those are put into virions. So here's an influenza virus whose genome is, in fact, in eight pieces. So it's one of these viruses that doesn't have a single molecule. It has eight pieces of genome. So the RNA, the negative sense RNA viruses, their genomes can occur in, in one molecule or in pieces. So influenza viruses, uh, six to eight RNA genome pieces, all in the same particle. You need all of them to start an infection. And then some of the other uh, negative strand viruses, the measles and mumps, the paramyxo, the, the rabies virus, their genomes are one long negative strand RNA. And these, this has implications for how these are expressed also, and we'll talk about that later. Now, the, the, uh, having a segmented genome is really important because it gives you more genetic variability. So all RNA viruses have enormous variability because their polymerases make errors and they can't correct them. So DNA polymerases can correct the errors they make, but RNA polymerases cannot. And in addition, viruses with a segmented genome do something called reassortment. So when two different say influenza viruses infect the cell, all the genes reassort in the cytoplasm, and the new viruses that are produced can have segments from both parents. They have to have all eight segments to be infectious, but they can have a mixture. We call this reassortment, as opposed to recombination, which is actual when, when you have a hybrid single RNA molecule. And this is one of the reasons why flu is, is a big problem, because you have reassortment between human and animal strains that are infecting a host, you get new viruses out and they are, can cause pandemics. So this is something we will come back to and it's a consequence of having uh, a segmented genome. Now some of these negative strand viruses are actually ambisense. They, they're, they're classified as negative sense genomes. You'll see why in a moment, but the genome is actually a mixture of plus and minus RNA and so Lassa virus is one of those and also Bunya viruses <coughs> another example. So what does this mean? So the genomes are on top here. These are actually the two, these vir the arena viruses package two different RNA segments in the virion. And you see that the green part is plus stranded and then the, the, um, the olive part is negative stranded. So that the RNA that's in the virion has both plus and minus character. In other words, this is equivalent to mRNA and this is the complement. Now, when these viruses infect cells, you couldn't predict what was going to happen here, right? So this is something that you only find out by investigation. The RNA gets in the cell. It's not translated, all right? Be probably because it doesn't have a cap at the 5' prime end. So what has to happen is the virus brings in an RNA polymerase with it and makes an mRNA from this negative part of the genome, all right? And that can be translated into protein, which can then go on to replicate this genome and make uh, mRNA from this, this five prime region. So that's why it's classified as a negative strand virus because it has to bring a polymerase in. It's not translated immediately upon entering the cell. Even though it has plus stranded sequences, only half the genome or so is plus strand, that can't be translated initially. <clears throat> All right, so those are our genomes. And um, as I said, if you can remember the seven classes, how they get to mRNA, that will really help you with the rest of our discussion because we're going to be for the next uh, eight or so lectures talking about replication and we're going to be talking about plus and minus strands and double strands and you really should know um, uh, the overview of that. <clears throat> I want to finish up today by talking about how we, the, the modern way of manipulating virus genomes, how we do genetics and how we study them and how we use them. We can actually use viruses to treat diseases, or we're trying to anyway. And just to make sure we are on the same page in terms of definition, we use wild type a lot in virology, and you've heard this in other areas of biology as well. For viruses, uh, this simply means that your standard, whatever is in your lab and is your standard virus, you call it wild type, and then you make your mutants from the wild type strain. Um, it may not be the same as a virus that is infecting people or animals out there in nature. It may be have been isolated years ago and you've passed it in your laboratory, but it's your wild type, so that's all that that means. Um, when, we, when we get viruses from a host, a clinical specimen or an animal, 
we call these field isolates or clinical isolates. And those can be brought in the lab and they could become your wild type if you wish, but, but uh, not unless it's a brand new virus. Now, an important method that we use in virology is DNA-mediated transformation. This is when we put DNA into cells. We take, DNA, we take cells in culture, we take purified DNA, we add it to the cells, and the cells take it up. There are tricks that we use to get the cells to take it up. It's not very hard. It's called DNA-mediated transformation. So why do we say this long word to describe it? Well, transformation has to do with oncogenic transformation of cells making tumors, for example. We'll talk about that later. So when people first described this process, they called it DNA-mediated. Now you may say, why did they call it transformation at all? And that's a historical thing. That goes back to 1944. This paper by Avery McLeod and McCarthy from right here in New York City at the Rockefeller Institute. <coughs> they found you could transform pneumococci, bacteria, into either a rough or a smooth colony by putting DNA from one morphology into the other. Okay, so they said we're transforming the cells with DNA. This was actually the proof that DNA was genetic material. It was up until 1944, many people didn't believe it. And even many years after that, many people didn't believe it as well. So transformation came from this paper, right? Uh, transformation of pneumococcal types. So we're stuck with it. So we call it DNA-mediated transformation, so you don't fuse it, uh, confuse it with oncogenesis. Now, when we take a virus genome and we put it into a cell and we get virus out, this is called transfection, the production of infectious virus after DNA-mediated transformation with viral DNA, first shown with uh, lambda DNA. And transfection comes from this word, transformation, infection. It was coined by the people who did the lambda studies. Now, <clears throat> Unfortunately, everybody uses transfection to just mean DNA-mediated transformation. It's not quite right, so we try and use the right terminology. But if you pick up a, a catalog from a, a biological supplier, they'll list transfection reagents. All right, Because it's easier to say transfection than DNA-mediated transformation. But I just want you to know that transfection, in our view, means making viruses from DNA. Okay? Now, when you... Genetic methods... In, involve altering the virus genome so that you can study the function of genes. Okay, we make changes in DNA, that's what mutation is, changes <coughs> in DNA or RNA. You can make nonsense or missense mutation, you know all this stuff. Uh, but the point I want to make here is that a mutation is not what you do to a protein. A mutation was originally coined to describe changes uh, in DNA. So we make mutations in viral genomes and then we study the phenotypes. The, the resulting proteins are altered. They have amino acid changes or insertions or deletions, but they're not mutated proteins because mutation is an uh, activity on, on nucleic acid. Now, this, uh, this assay, which we talked about last time, the plaque assay, is what made possible genetic analysis of viruses because you can then start to isolate clonal populations of viruses by picking virus from individual plaques. You can see here how some of these plaques are very close together. So you, you definitely want to do multiple plaque pickings as we said last time. All right, so plaque assay allows genetic methods to go forward. So from 1952 when Dobeko made the plaque assay for animal viruses, from that point on genetics of viruses could be done. Could be done before with bacteriophage because they, the plaque assay was developed for them earlier. Now in the old days <coughs> people would have their virus and look for mutants in a tube of virus that they had in the laboratory. They had no way of really directing mutations to specific parts of the genome. Uh, as I said earlier, and we will come back to this many times, RNA virus polymerases are highly error prone. They make one misincorporation in every 10,000 to 100,000 nucleotides that they polymerize. And they don't correct these errors. So when you just grow up a stock of influenza virus, it's not one virus, it's a collection of mutants. And all you have to do is apply the right selection to get the mutant out you want. If you want a, mutant, a viral mutant resistant to an antibody or a drug, you just apply selection and you can easily get it from a stock of uh, RNA viruses. Uh, DNA viruses have lower misincorporation rates. Mutations are harder to come by in their genomes. So typically you treat them with chemicals that mutagenize the DNA and then screen for your phenotype. So these are some of the phenotypes you can screen for, as I said, drug resistance, plaque size, 
If your virus makes a big plaque, you see a, pl a small plaque on the plate, it's a mutant. You pick it and study it and see what gene has been altered. All right, so this is the old style of genetics in viruses. We don't do this anymore because it's too haphazard. Uh, now what we do is we have, for, for most viruses that are studied, what are called infectious DNA clones. You take the viral genome, whether it's DNA or RNA, you make a DNA copy of it, you amplify it in a bacterial plasmid, so you can get lots of it, and then you take that DNA and you put it into a cell. You transfect the cell, and the cell will make infectious virus. This is actually a modern validation of Al Hershey and Martha Chase's experiment, right? It shows that the DNA is the genetic material of the genome. And you can make all kinds of changes to DNA. So if you had an RNA virus like influenza virus, the only thing you could ever do was to treat it with chemicals or just try and select out mutants from the population. But now you can introduce specific mutations. You can make recombinant viruses. You can make anything you want. And in fact, people are very afraid of this. You only have to look in, uh, online to see people who think that the genetic engineers are going wild with viruses and making uh, viruses that are going to kill everyone. Well, this is not entirely true, of course, but we can modify them uh, at will. So for example, with poliovirus, the virus contains an RNA genome. It's plus-stranded. You, if you extract that RNA from the particle, which you can do, and you can purify the RNA, if you inserted that into cells by transfection, that would initiate an infectious cycle. Just the mRNA, because it just has to be translated, <coughs> make proteins, and you initiate replication. So the RNA is infectious. But we can't really modify RNA. So what we did was to make a DNA copy of the viral RNA in a plasmid. And then when you put that into cells, it gives rise to virus as well. You can either put the DNA into cells, or you can make RNA in vitro and put that into cells and it's infectious. So again, this is the modern way we do genetics in virology. You're going to hear about this all the time. We're going to talk about experiments where we make X modification to viral genomes. It's all going to be done with infectious DNA clones. Uh, this is the way you do it for influenza virus. I, I show you this because I want to tell you what was done with this technique. Uh, influenza virus has eight uh, RNA segments. So you have to make a plasmid for each of the eight RNA segments. <clears throat> and these plasmids are, are very trickily made. They actually have two promoters in them. A Pol2 promoter going in one direction and a Pol1 promoter going in the other. When you put this plasmid into a cell, it goes in the nucleus, Pol1 initiates here and makes the viral RNAs, which are negative strand. Pol2 initiates here and makes mRNAs, which make proteins. So you take eight plasmids, you put them in a cell, and you get influenza virus out. So you can recreate any influenza virus that you want. So it's not as simple as for polio because you need eight plasmids, but it still can be done. Now, back in 1918, as many of you know, there was a big pandemic called Spanish influenza. Many millions of people died. But we didn't have influenza virus at the time. We didn't actually know it was a virus. Inf human influenza wasn't isolated until 1933. So we didn't have this virus, which was so devastating, we couldn't study it. When people developed this eight plasmid transfection technique, what they then did was say, let's get the sequence of the 1918 virus and put it into plasmids and make that virus back again. So how did they do this? So it turned out that a lot of the people who died of influenza in 1918 were people in the army. Right? So the army kept a lot of their pathology specimens from their lungs. They would take their lungs out and make blocks and fix them and embed them in paraffin. So they had all of those stored somewhere. So the investigators went and got a bunch of those. And they were actually able to sequence the viral RNA from it. They got most of the RNA genome sequenced from this 1918 virus. So these are soldiers who had died from 1918 flu. But they didn't get the whole thing. So what they also did, they went up to the permafrost up in Alaska where people had died. There was an outbreak of 1918 influenza, and people had died, and they were buried and had been frozen in the ground and since 1918. And they opened up the graves, and they did a biopsy of the lung, and they pulled out tissue. This is all done with approval, of course. They didn't do it surreptitiously at night. Uh, and then they got RNA out of these biopsies and sequenced it, and they completed the whole sequence. So then they put the sequences into each of the eight plasmids. They put the plasmids in cells, and now we have the 1918 influenza virus. This has to be worked at under BSL-4 conditions because it's highly lethal. 
every animal that you put this in, mice, ferrets, uh, guinea pigs, they're wiped out. So we can understand what made this virus lethal by recovering it in this way. Many people think we, sh think we should not have done this experiment because someone, these sequences are published, right? So anyone could go into GenBank and get these sequences and make this virus if you wanted to do that and make a, a weapon, for example. But I think that risk is pretty low. I think the benefits outweigh this, the, the kind of research that we can do. All right, the last thing I want to tell you about is good uses of viruses for curing uh, human diseases. We, we have been able to make viral vectors and put foreign genes into them. And so these are used for gene therapy. There are lots of diseases where patients lack a specific gene. And so one of the most common approaches is to take cells from these patients. Now we're, we're beginning to take bone marrow stem cells out. You infect them with a virus that will supply the gene that's missing, and then you infuse these cells back into the patient. Now, of course, you need to use a virus that will not kill these cells, and there are plenty of nonlytic uh, viruses that we can work with. Uh, but a lot of these have been developed and are being used in very small trials to treat a variety of diseases. We also use them in research as well. Here are some genetic diseases that are amenable to gene therapy. For example, SCIDS, severe combined immunodeficiency, is a defect in a very specific gene. So when you have a one gene defect, you can think about repairing it. Factor eight, factor seven, and factor nine deficiency, uh, LDL receptor, cystic fibrosis is a defect in a, a channel, a transporter channel in the lung. So a lot of these and other uh, gene defects are being corrected or trying to correct with uh, gene therapy. One of the most common vectors that it, that's used is retroviral vectors. The other one are these single-stranded DNA viruses like parvoviruses, those are being used as well. Now a lot of this won't make sense to you yet because we haven't covered retroviruses, but uh, what you do if you want to make a retrovirus to do gene therapy is you, you put the genome into two plasmids. You have a plasmid that um, has the coding region to make the capsid proteins and you, may, you have another plasmid with what's called the envelope proteins. These are the glycoproteins that will be in the membrane of the virus. Now if you take ju just these two plasmids and you transfect them into cells, you get empty retrovirus particles. There's no genome in there because you, you haven't inserted one. You've just made a particle. But now let's say you want to insert a gene in here. You just take the same two plasmids and then you add a third plasmid containing your gene of interest. You want to correct the gene defect, you put the gene in here, and you put signals in it so it will be incorporated into the retrovirus. So three plasmids, you transfect them in cells, you now have a retrovirus containing a foreign gene. And you can use that to try and treat genetic diseases. Now these vectors, of course, are gutted so they don't cause any disease. They do integrate into your DNA. And there have been some cases where individuals have had tumors arise because these vectors, they integrate rather randomly, they integrate next to an oncogene and activate it and so tumors arise. So there's a lot of workarounds that we need to do still to uh, make these work better. But retroviruses, parvoviruses, and a couple of other viruses being increasingly used and maybe in 10 to, to 15 years this will be commonplace uh, to treat diseases in this way. And here's an example, X-linked adrenoleukodystrophy. So this is a CNS disease, typically fatal. Uh, it's a defect in a transporter called ABCD1. And in this trial, uh, a couple of, uh, two patients, two children with this disease, their bone marrow was taken out. It was infected in culture with a, a, a lentiviral, a retroviral vector with a normal gene. And then they infused these cells back into the patients and their status stabilized. They stopped degenerating and, and, and one of them, I think, uh, improved. So, a small clinical trial, but just an example of what you can do with, uh, with viruses. And that's it for today. <laughs>